Okay, if you would stand, and uh, let me read to you the first part of chapter 2 in Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Chapter 2. Paul has been talking in chapter 1 about the wrath of God. He continues now in chapter 2. He says, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Whoever are you uh, who judge? For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The things Paul's referring to, that they're judging each other about, they've sinned back in verse 29. Unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. A whole litany of sins that people at, at that time and still are were committing against God. The title of the message is The Reality of God's Wrath. Now how can you preach, how could I preach this message on a snowy day in Adair County when the people who come out are the dedicated, the committed, the saved? How could I preach a message on God's wrath? Well, it'll make sense when I get to the end. So bear with me. Most of y'all are, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to those who are converted. But let's see in the end how it turns out. All right. Lent began last Wednesday on Ash Wednesday. Our pyramid colors have turned from the white of the transfiguration to the purple of Lent, a royal purple that Jesus wore and he was mocked in that purple reddish robe. So our focus is the cross. Ash Wednesday, if we could have met, we would have brought out the fact that we are mortal. We will one day die. If I had a chance to mark your foreheads with ashes, I would say, from dust you were created and to dust you shall return emphasizing your mortality and mine. We will die one day. And yet at times as folks were kneeling at the altar being marked by ashes, I've also said, remember the price paid for your sin. Remember the cross. And that's what Lent is. Remembering what Jesus has done. We remember him year round, but particularly now, focused on that. Now, not, not, not in a morbid mood at all, in a joyful mood or on a beautiful day, but to consider how many people die each week in the Adair County area. To answer that question, I turned to Columbia Magazine and I counted the number of obituaries in a seven-day period from February 12th to February 18th. 22 persons passed away. So I took on my calculator, multiplied 22 times 52, and in the Adair County area, 1,144 people will die in a year. That's a lot of people. We are mortal, and we will all die. And we want to be ready, and we want others to be ready. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, 
when the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, they were fussing at him. They were challenging him. They were complaining about him because he was eating with tax collectors and persons of other sinful lives, lifestyles. And he said to them, the well have no need of a physician. The sick do. I didn't come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners to repentance. That's the gospel, calling sinners to repentance. When John the Baptist baptized people, preparing them for Jesus, his baptism was a baptism of forgiveness for repentance of sins. His baptism did not include the Holy Spirit coming into your heart, but his baptism was authorized to forgive your sin. So the first point of the message is we are all mortal. We are all mortal. Will everyone go to heaven? I hope you're shaking your head now. There are some religious groups, even within Christianity, that believe everyone's going to heaven. They didn't read Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Death. Uh, there is a wrath. Those who rebel against God are storing up, treasuring up wrath. Now when you hear the word treasure, you think, oh, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus wants me to lay up treasure in heaven. He wants me to lay up good deeds, deeds of obedience to God, and that's exactly what he means. But that is not at all what Paul's talking about in Romans 2. He is talking about persons who are treasuring up wrath, punishment for disobeying God, punishment for mocking Him, for forgetting Him, for ignoring Him. If you read on into Romans 2, you'll find the contrast between those who obey God, the good, and then those who don't, the wicked. We know that there will be a reward for the righteous, and we know there will be wrath for the sinner. Day and night. But a lot of people don't, and a lot of people ignore it, a lot of people forget it, a lot of people drift from it. And so this message isn't for you per se, but it's for those that you're going to talk to. Because the unbeliever might ask us, if your God is so good, how could he send someone to hell? If your God is so good, why is there evil in the world? Well, obviously your God is not that good or he's not that powerful. Look at all this evil. Well, after the fact that we are all mortal is the fact that we are sinful. We are sinful. We have to admit it. We would admit to the atheist, to the unbeliever, the one challenging us, if your God is so powerful, why can't he take away all this evil? What would you say? What would you say? Part of our Wednesday night class is helping us with ways to talk to people that don't believe. As a matter of fact, if you have a friend or someone you know that might be interested in the reason for God, thinking about God, I will give you a book to give to that person, a free discussion guide or a free main book, if they'll come. If they'll come. I am so convinced that God can defend himself I'm not worried about anybody questioning me about, oh, if your God is, obviously your God's limited because he can't take away all evil. And I would reply back to them, you know, we choose evil. We choose evil. God created us with a choice, with a free will. He created Adam and Eve with a free will. Gave them only one condition to stay in the garden. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else is yours. But they had the freedom to eat if they wanted to. Satan tempted them. 
lied to Eve, she eats the fruit, she disobeys God, and sin begins. But it never ended. It never ended. Every one of us was born sinful. We're born selfish. I mean, there's a lot of good people. But our hearts are not right with God until they're right through Jesus. We're all sinful. Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, of God's way. We don't measure up to the way God would do it. We don't make it. We don't make the cut. We're lost. There's a story told from the courtroom about a fellow who was trying to get his defendant off, trying to get him free from the charges. That is a, a lawyer's job if you are uh, defending the accused. This story happened in Los Angeles about 60 years ago. It was a murder trial. It was a difficult case because a lot of the evidence was circumstantial. And the accused is a man, his defense lawyer, thought up this ingenious ploy to finish his speech to the jury. So in his final argument before the jury, he said this, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must find my client not guilty of murder. If there is the slightest doubt in your minds that he is not the murderer. And now I have one final witness. The true murderer is about to walk through that door. All heads turned to look at the door. No one came through. The lawyer continued. You see, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there is doubt in your minds, otherwise you would not have looked toward the door. The jury retired to deliberate and make their decision. They came back in just five hours and rendered this decision. Guilty. The defense lawyer was beside himself and before the judge could pass judgment on or pass sentence, he sprang up and said, but I proved you had a doubt in your mind about my client's guilt. How can you possibly find him guilty? And a wise older man in the jury stood up and said, as everyone looked toward the door, I watched your client. His eyes did not turn toward the door. He did not look towards the door because he knew no one was coming through. Because he himself was the guilty one. Case closed. Guilty. We are guilty of sin. No one can distract from it. No one can cover it. No one can atone for it. No one can make up for it. We're sinners. Praise God, there is a way of forgiveness. Those who choose not to ask Jesus Christ to forgive them for their sins are condemned. Apart from Christ, we are all condemned. We are condemned to death. The wrath of God is real. The wicked will be punished eternally. It's scary to think about. The wages of sin is death. In Psalm 50, the psalmist says this, But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing that you hate instructions and cast my words behind you? Verse 22 says, And consider this, you who forget God, Consider this, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. God's wrath is there. If they don't consider repentance and turning to him in obedience, he will tear them to pieces with none to deliver. None to deliver means no savior, no lawyer, no intervention. Condemned to hell and then condemned to the lake of fire. The atheist asks, how could your God condemn someone to hell? 
How could your God do such a thing? Everyone reaps what they sow. They chose it. He made a way for us to be saved. He sent His only Son for us to be saved. And people ignored Him. Turned Him down. Turned their back. What do they deserve? Death. They deserve the wrath if they turn their back on the Son of God who came to save them. The good news is, good news is we are resurrected. We in Christ, that's all of y'all, are resurrected to eternal life, taken to heaven. Hallelujah. Do you remember the story last week in Paul Hebert's village in India? What interested the people in that village the most was not that the girl died of smallpox, but that the Christians believed in the resurrection. They believed she would be raised from the dead. They believed they would see her again. We will see our loved ones again. We'll see Jesus. We are resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, For since by man came death, but by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Adam the first man, Jesus the second man. 55 verse, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh Hades, where is your victory? Verse 57, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are resurrected. Church, the last prayer offered on behalf of a believer is the committal prayer. At that committal time, at committal service, usually at the graveside, with the, with the grave dug and the casket set above it, the last prayer offered that the preacher can pray is, Father, into your hands we commit this person's spirit, and to the ground we commit this body, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, earth to earth. And then it's all done. The soul is with Christ, and the body is in the ground. Victory for the believer. But a preacher can't pray that at someone, at a lost person's funeral. Oh, the body we commit to the ground, dust to dust, or ashes to ashes, from dust you are created to dust you shall return. We can say that, but we don't know where the soul is. God's the judge. We're not the judge of that either. But we can't commit someone to heaven. For us, heaven, we're resurrected. Good news, we're all set. Secondly, we are forgiven. That's how we got into heaven. We're forgiven. We bear our sins no more. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Just. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thirdly, I first wrote we are free, but I wrote we are released. We are released from the bondage of death. John 8, 36, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We are free to live for the Lord, free to love Him, free to serve Him, free to sing. Free. The good news is, that's why we're gathered. That's why we're here. We're free. The bad news is, these people aren't. They aren't free. But you and I can help make them free. We can't save them. But we can pray that God would reach them and maybe use us or maybe somebody else to reach them with the gospel. The persons of most, of highest priority are the lost who have no commitment to Jesus. And honestly, I work with you all I don't know the people in Adair County that are lost. Take me to them. Take me with you. But I don't know them. You do. But I do know four people that are lost, and I have them on my list. And my list got going because the other concern is for the people that have a commitment to Jesus, but they've drifted. They're not with him. We might call them backsliders. We might call them uh, cold. But they're not in obedience to God. 
And Adair County is full of them. Full of them. Numbers, if, if 1,144 people are going to die this year in this area, of course that includes Taylor County and other counties, Clinton County and all that. 18,000 people in Adair County. What is there? About 18% are in church. Say one in five are in church. So we've done the math before. 3,600 people in church on a Sunday, which is very unimpressive. You know that. Y'all are here. Y'all the choir. Way to go. Way to come. But as much as Adair County has been soaked in the gospel of Jesus for years and for generations, I know there are people out there with a commitment to Christ that aren't keeping it. And so I'm going to ask you to pray for them and ask you to invite them to church. They're there. And don't feel the pressure because you aren't going to change their heart. You're not going to make them come to church. God will. God will do the work. I might have been nervous as a younger preacher. Oh, we've, we've got to have some souls saved so I can show fruit in this congregation. But I can't save them. That's a powerless situation. I can't save them. God does. He does. He knows who they are and where they are. And he knows they want him more than they know. So in a moment, if you'll have your yellow paper ready, and again, if you didn't bring one and you just want to write a name on a paper or just bring one in your mind, but I, I would like to invite all of you to pray at the altar for the people on the list. How does the church grow? The church grows when the body connects to the lost and invites them to come. When the body connects to the drifted and invites them to come back. That's how the church grows. There's no big formula. There's no magic method. Don't even need a book to do that. People you know asking God to prepare their heart and inviting them to something we do. Invite them to a movie night. We're going to have a music night in March. Invite them to a music night. Invite them to Easter Sunday. Invite them to something we do. It can't hurt to ask. And we'd be very negligent if we didn't.